and you know but anyway lee's amazing lee has been in the business just over 50 years now as is kind of a big deal she did start at two so she was 19 you know don't do math it's it's rude but all i want you to know is lee has forgotten more than most of us collectively will have put together but she has been through how many ups and downs and how many challenging markets and she can handle and, and work with any market she can deal with snow like yeah. we're seeing she can deal with stop it she's amazing and so come to learn take notes um i'll be tapping over my phone because that's where i take my notes but i just want you to know it's it's such a treat and lee such a delight to have you, thank you. Thank you. so let's give lee a big hand if you want well, thank you all and thank you for coming out on a really snowy day they're recording this so I want to make sure we make note of the fact that I have a full classroom of really brave, good drivers in a, in a storm that they were putting on TV, the alerts of snow squalls, don't go on the roads. I have no idea. Testing one, I don't think so. Okay, well, turn, turn me on. It should be that easy, girls. And so anyways, I appreciate everybody out in the snow showing up anyways uh, and this is where i have to turn my back to you for a second and just say to all the zoomers up there wimps wimps <laughs> i'm glad you're here zoomers uh and glad that you all are here personally so uh, this is the sixth shift in the market um that i've been through um i still am actively listing and selling homes um and so hopefully I can give you whatever you're looking for today. So we have kind of a free flow with the topic being listings. We have two hours to do it. I'd like to know what it is you wanna get out of this two hours for you. And it's gonna be a variety. I've got somebody as new as five and a half weeks. Who's my longest in the business besides probably Dean and I? How many years, Laurie? 27, spring chicken, really, yeah. Okay, so zero to 27. So wide variety here. So shout out, and we're going to put it up on the parking lot here, um, what it is you'd like to make sure I cover today. And we'll see how much of it we can achieve. You're here for a reason. Shout it out. Okay. Okay. Setting realistic expectations with your colleagues. Expectations with sellers. So another hand. That's all you want? Well, I could let you out early, but I won't. Okay. If that's really all, then we're going to do a few different things. So... How many of you, first of all, have a visual presentation for when you go out on a listing? Raise of hands high so that I can kind of see. Okay, for those who do not, on the hub, there is a really good one that you can personalize. Um, and I suggest you do that. The reason being is most human beings are visual learners. So don't be telling them something when you could also be showing them the something. So please make sure you have a presentation. Um, secondly, do any of you prior to going on an appointment, send anything or deliver anything to your appointment prior to going? Tell me what you put, put out. Park conditions, what we're going to do for them, why we're better than the other people they're going to talk to. Okay. And I have that also. I actually email that out yeah. as a short video, about three minutes long. And, uh, and then it covers our entire marketing plan. And it also includes the seller's property disclosure documents and tells them that their homework assignment before we meet is to get that done. So if you're not doing those things that they're less likely to stand you up if they've gotten that. Yes. You would consider that your pre-listing that's my package. that's my pre-listing package yes it does not include a net sheet because we have not talked pricing okay i'll tell you where i do my net sheet i do a cma 
and I bind it down the side. On the inside back cover is where I write up a net sheet while we're sitting there after we've established price. Okay. All right. So having a visual, doing a pre-listing uh, package is a good idea. Um, next is, are you finding listings in the same places that you did? We have somebody that says the changing market. Where are your listings coming from right now? SOI, mine too, mine too. Are you finding yours too? Open houses. Open houses, my second favorite source after SOI. We're getting them from Google as well. Okay, we also get the Google, yep. Now, in order to get the Google, what do you have to have? Reviews. So let's take just a minute and talk about a side note of reviews. How are you getting your reviews? Pardon? Just asking for them before. Wow, what a concept, just asking. Yeah, before, before and after. Um, we do on our presentations, both with buyers and sellers, at the very end of our presentation, after we've signed all the documents, we do the promise script. And the promise script I've done here before, you all have that on a video. You also have my pre-listing um, marketing videos, my pre-listing package and you also in your library here have my full listing presentation so that's why today i can kind of go to this and say what do you want because some of it is already accessible to you so grab onto it if you find you need it um, but reviews so at the end of every presentation um, tell me your name greg. greg so at the end of the presentation i will say greg i've got one more thing to talk about can we take another minute Sure. Great. So I want to tell you about, hey, Brooke, I never get Brooke in my classes. This is great. Um, so, well, that's true. Um, I'll say, Greg, get another minute. One more thing I want to talk to you about. Great. So on the Stern team, we have this goal. We call it our promise. And that is to make this transaction, this process, better than you could ever imagine it. Uh, to keep it just as smooth as we can make it. And all the people and all the systems we have on the team are designed with that in mind. Now it's real estate, so there are people. Doesn't mean we won't run into challenges, but my goal is to get ahead of those challenges and just keep it as smooth as it can go. How does that sound for you, Greg? Oh, great. Wonderful. So I have one other personal uh, goal that I'll share with you. And that is that during the time we're working together, you're going to feel so good about the service you are getting that you're going to be telling people about me and referring people to me is uh, referrals on my lifeblood, Greg. So I really appreciate you doing that. But I'm going to ask you to take it one step farther. When you find somebody who has a question about real estate, wants to buy or sell, maybe needs to refinance. I'm hoping that you'll give me a call with their name and number so there's a 100% chance I can reach out to them. Would you be willing to do that for me, Craig? Yes. Wonderful. Now, if we get down to the closing and you haven't referred anybody to me, we're going to have to have that tough conversation. I'm going to have to assume that either I or my team did something to let you down. And I'm going to want to talk about that, okay? But you'll pick up the phone and call me, right? Sure. Perfect. So that's our promise script. And we do that on every presentation. So now what happens is when I call Greg to say, hey, Greg, the photographer is coming out to do the photography. By the way, have you thought of anybody I should be helping yet? Or when I say, okay, grand opening is Saturday, 11 to 3. I need you gone by 10 o'clock. Can you do that? Great. Have you thought of anybody I should help yet? Yes. Can I give an objection that I'm sure you'd handle? Certainly. So uh, I'm, I'm your client. You just mm -hmm. give me the promise mm -hmm. script. Uh, I don't meet that many people who are looking to make real estate transactions. I don't think I'm going to run into something. You know, that may be the case. However, here's the interesting thing. Do you remember when you bought your last car? Yes. What, what brand is it? It's a Tesla. Tesla. And after you bought it, do you recall how now suddenly everywhere you look, there are Teslas? That's true. It is so true. Matter of fact, you park next to them and you're like, oh my gosh, nobody had them before I got them. Now they all have them, right? 
Yeah, that's a okay. good point. So what that is, is that's your RAS. There's a little spot at the back of your brain that when you're focused on something, suddenly it's all you see. So in the selling of your house, you're going to be surprised to run into other people who are thinking about doing exactly that same thing. And when that happens, if that happens, can I count on you pick up the phone and give me their name and number so there's a 100% chance I can talk to them? Yes, you can, Lee. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So there is that RAS, the reticular activator at the base of your brain that once you're focused on something, suddenly you just, it, 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 it's amazing. You're surprised at how often that is now happening. Okay. You'll be at the copy machine and somebody will say, you know, it's Friday and they'll say, what are you doing this week? Oh, we're going to go look at open houses. Oh my gosh, you're looking to buy a house. You should be using my realtor. I got one of those calls yesterday. Um, my client, I just put into a house this month, earlier this month, and the guy at her office is looking to buy a house. Best news is Chip called me last night, the guy she referred me to. Chip called me last night. He has one house that he wants to see, wants to write an offer, and he wants to do that tomorrow. I have three great grandchildren tomorrow and seven family members arriving from Wisconsin. So he's going to go see it with the at the open house and I've notified the open house agent. My lender got him pre-approved last night. I just got a text when I arrived here say today, letting me know he's qualified to way more than we need him to be. And he knows that when I leave this class, I'm racing back to write an offer for him that I'm gonna send him, but he's not allowed to sign until tomorrow after he goes to the open house because they're gonna take offers as, as they arrive beginning on Saturday. So how easy is that? when you've taught your people how to give you referrals, okay? So in addition to that, there's the writing of the review. So we get down to closing and I'm sitting at the closing table with Greg and he's selling his house and he's all excited and you know, we'll have the money in your bank tomorrow and we'll wire it and it's so good. Um, so I was thinking, would you mind pulling out your phone and going on Google for me just for a second. Could you do that, Greg? Sure. Great. And just I'll pull up Google. And uh, if you just type in the Stern team, and then you'll see on the right-hand side, there's a little place that you can write a review. And I want you to go crazy and sing my praises. Could you do that for me, please? Sure. Mention me my name too. Would you do okay. that? Because I'm so old. Most of my clients you? can't do this. I know I love it. Thank you so much. So here's another way you could do that. We just did. Uh, we did this and so did Linda Birch last week. We did a reverse bowl. How many of you have been to bowl before? Oh, not many. All right. When bold comes next, to Utah, which is usually once or twice a year, everybody in this room needs to just get signed up for bold. So in bold, uh, we're doing what we call a reverse bold, where we have sent out an email to all of our clients saying on, ours was last Friday, on Friday between 11 and 5, if you call in to this number or call your agent, um, you will be registered for a drawing. And we were giving away two of four things, a Traeger Grill, a $250 Amazon, a three National Park Passes, or I can't remember what the fourth one was. And so now they call me. So when Greg called me, I go, Greg, let me double check and make sure I've got all your right information. So that new address where you moved to after we sold your house, what was that address again? I could clarify that this is the best phone number. I've got that one. And your email is still Greg at Gmail, right? Perfect. So it's my way to update my database. And then I go, Greg, I've got you in the drawing. They'll be drawing, doing the drawing on Monday. So I'll call you if you win. And I want you to win. But if you want to write me a review, now you've already written me a review, but your wife hasn't. So you can go on her phone. Remember how you Googled the Stern team? You could write me another review. That would get you two more entries. Um, or if you have a friend call me, maybe one of your kids, um, I would put them in my VIP club and I'd stay in touch with them like I stay in touch with you. 
But if you hear of somebody who's wanting to buy, sell, or has a question in real estate and you're referring to me today, it's five extra raffles. Okay. So I know we ended up with something like 12 referrals. I've got one. One of my calls I made to Eloise, I sold two houses for Eloise and she bought a house from me walking into an open house. I like those. And then I captured her as a client and sold two houses. She moved to Texas. So I called her up and I said, hey, how's life in Texas? She said, I moved to Florida. And I went, well, how's life in Florida? And she's getting her real estate license. And we're just chit-chatting. And I said, how's, how's your youngest doing? She said, oh, he's up in Park City. He's got a great job. He's loving it. He really needs to find a house. And I said, well, there is an affordable housing program in Park City. I think Anthony would qualify. She said, I'll have him call you tomorrow. So got a referral for Anthony to buy a house. So all of those make a lot of sense. Those reverse bolds clear up the information on your database. And I probably had that day, I don't know, 15 or so database changes, updates that I made. So where we think we have a set database, it does change. But it's a great way to get more reviews because you need them to get GLS calls. Um, we, we honestly, we compete. Don't, don't tell Clay. We compete with Clay and the red team and William Bustos on who can keep the most reviews. Sometimes it's us. Sometimes it's Clay. Sometimes it's William. But we're constantly doing that. Every month we're looking at the three of us to see where they are. Um, I think we're at about 1,000. Yeah. But truthfully, that's a team. As an individual, if you have 10 or 15, you're way ahead of, honestly, most agents. But I do think that Google is a really viable source. Costs you nothing. Just being focused on getting reviews. Okay? Twice a year, I would recommend you do a a reverse bold where they have to call you and just clean up your database. Okay. Not quite sure how we got to that. Oh, I know what it was. I said, how are you getting listings? So again, I agree. Most of mine are coming from my SOI. Um, my second favorite is open houses and I still do a lot of open houses. So right now, when you're calling your SOI, what are you saying to them? This was my question to you. So somebody shouts out what they're saying to them. Oh my gosh, yes. If you all have an event, we just had our casino night. So that was our thing that we could use. But having events now in your market center here, what events do you have? You have the Easter egg hunt. I just got a copy of the invitation in my email. So I'm on somebody's SOI. So Water thank park. you. <laughs> Water park. Yep. Okay. What else do you do? Pumpkin patch. Pumpkin patch. Okay. You do all family things. Yep. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yes, that's true. The challenge that you may have in that, I'm not opposed to it because you're right. Lots of families. In Utah County, you have the long, youngest demographics, I think, in the state. So that makes a lot of sense. But what about Greg and I? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Maybe here, maybe not. Okay. So what if they don't? Might you think about having one other thing that isn't, and I don't know, but you may be missing a part of that population. Well, yes. What kind of success have you had for events that are not family-based? So like, what, and what else do you do? What else does yours have? Um, so we do an annual Death by Chocolate or a chocolate party. Um, and so that's one that we do. We uh, have the casino night. That's an office one. The death by chocolate is an individual one. Um, and then we do a summer barbecue at the park uh, one. I think we're going to do the water park one uh, for a family one for our Stern team. And then we do pie day. So uh, we have them come to, I think, four or five different locations 
that they can stop in whatever one's convenient. By the way, you know you can do that, right? So I'm always at the South Valley one, but I'm, my office is Sugar House. Uh, we're up at the Layton office. Um, I don't know if we're here or not. But they can come in. We make chili. They can come in and have chili with us. And then they walk away with an apple or a pumpkin pie. It's one of our biggest ones. During COVID, we still did it. They just stayed in their car and we brought it to the car and handed it through the window. But that one always is a big one for us. Can ask a question on that? We're hitting the point where we've done pies for years, but mm -hmm. we deliver it. But we're hitting that threshold of, you know, almost 100 pies this year, two days. That's way too many. What's your ratio or... You know, I, I have a limiting belief that I wouldn't drive anywhere for a pie. Like, so I, I have that limiting belief. And I, how do you? Well, I don't know. A hundred of your people would. So obviously you're doing something right. And some of them like pie. But we, the, take, it we take it to them now. Oh, okay. That, that's my concern okay. is how do we scale it? Scale it? Yeah, so ours drive to it and it's a lot of pies. So obviously people do like pie. I can tell you that. Um, you may not, I don't do a pie, but honestly, it's a nonstop for three hours, five to eight um, pies in, in all the locations. So I think it, do, it does. Linda Birch, I, the one thing I do, and this is a bad thing for me to have started 50 years ago, but nonetheless, it is what I started and I was stupid. And that is my fudge deliveries. And so I make homemade fudge and I deliver it to all of my SOI. So um, about 200 people get delivered fudge. It is hell. Can I tell you that? It takes me like 30 days of delivering fudge. Well, two days, two and a half days to make the fudge. That's actually the easy part. The delivering is the hard part. And, you know, you knock at the door and you really pray they're not home. Um, you do. But the reality is when they are home, you go in, you get to visit. It's wonderful. I love it. But when I ring the bell, I pray every time they won't be home. So you just leave it on the doorstep. And then I leave it on the doorstep. So Linda Birch, who's way smarter than me, um, she does deliveries and she does deliveries, I think, four times a year. And she hires a single mom. And it doesn't cost her a whole lot to do it. She's told me how much, and I don't remember at the moment, but you could call Linda Birch and ask her. So she does um, uh, she does jars of uh, lentil soup, the layered lentil soup that she, she makes the layers and does all that, and then has a young girl take them. So the girl takes them to the house, gets to Chris's house, puts it on the doorstep, snaps a picture, and emails it to her with the house number. So then Linda gets on the phone and says, hey, Chris, it's it's Linda. I missed you. I dropped off your soup. It's on your front porch, but I really miss seeing you. Way smarter. Yes. I just want to go back to the pie thing. Yeah. Um, them driving to you or delivering it. I think it's important that they get it, right? but it's also important that you're having the conversations before the pie or after. It is. And both. Before the pie and after, and, and when they get the pie. And that's why we do the chili. You'd be amazed. Most of them come in and have chili. So now I've got them all sitting down here chit-chatting, and I'm flitting from table to table. Okay? Um, and you could make it easier for them by if you have various locations. We cover a, a large area um, demographically. So we have Tooele, Layton, South Valley, and... Sugar House. So it is four locations that we, so whichever location is easiest for them, that's the one they come to. Okay. Linda also does leaf bags. She delivers, has the single mom deliver leaf bags to all of her clients that have her um, logo on the bag. And she says it's so fun because she also delivers it to some of her neighbors. And it's so fun to watch on the curb. There'll be all these bags of her logo. <laughs> so she does that. Um, I'm trying to think what the other two are because she has four. Oh, I know. In the summer, she does one that has a little package of sunscreen, bug spray, then like an aloe gel or something. All, bra all branded. 
Oh, she did the Valentine's. Thank you. Yes. So she had, and this was her most expensive one. That one cost $10 each, but she did a chocolate where it has the shells and it comes with a little mini hammer. And so you have to crack that to get to the chocolate, break the crock, chocolate shell to get to the real chocolate. But she said that one, she got more calls from her clients than anything else she'd done. So doing something like that. So back to your SOI and what we're, what we say to them. So one is going out and doing visits or having somebody do that makes more personal. Linda's rate of return is really, really good. So she's been um, really happy with those results. Um, doing events, inviting them to events is another. But what else could you be calling and saying to them right now? Yeah. Well, I do 200 things of fudge. I don't pick the grumpy ones that I don't like. I pick my favorites. You know, favorites would be always your first year that you've had them. Those that send you referrals on a regular basis and those that you just plumb like. The other ones you could skip. Okay. So what else are you saying to your SOI when you're calling them? What would you say right now? You're, you're done with the event, so you can't invite them to an event. What well, might be another reason for calling? Market conditions. So right now, um, do you remember when we, when we had COVID and I was here um, teaching after that, and so we talked a little about it. We all made client care calls where we just called Greg and said, hey, how are you doing and how's the family doing? Are you staying safe? You got your mask on? Staying healthy? Got the boosters. That a boy. That a boy. That's what I'm counting on. There's another one coming, so make sure you get that one. Just checking with them on that. So right now, my my clientele, not all, but many of them are now old. I don't know how this happened, but they got old. Um, and so I'm, I'm calling those people and saying, okay, so you're probably worried, Brooke, about these bank closures. And so I just am calling today to make sure that in no one institution do you have more than 250,000, right? Okay, check those balances and make sure, because if so, switch a little bit of it over to another bank, okay? Um, I honestly think that a lot of this bank situation is being caused by social media. So once one person decides they're worried about their thing, social media it out and it becomes a frenzy. So our downside can be on social media. Um, so be a little leery about that, but I want you to protect yourself. Okay. Well, I do want you to move some because you're insured, whether you're in a credit union or a bank, you're insured up to 250,000 per institution. So if you're at you first, you credit union, and you've got 250, fine. But then if you've got more than 250, let's open something over at Zions or something and keep that one at 250. Now, some of you are youngsters and saying, they're not gonna have 250. My clientele mostly has 250 or more. And so I do need to call and have that conversation, okay? So that would be one you could have. Um, I think, how many of you got your realtor magazine for the month? Okay. How many of you read your realtor magazine? Mm -hmm. Do that. It's really good. So there, there was a section in there about the benefits of this market for buyers. So what if you just went through and said, hey, you probably heard about the Fed yesterday going up another quarter percent. That's the ninth increase in the last year that we've had. Um, it's slowing down. So that's good. Um, I think that'll be, it'll come to an end soon. A lot of people, unlike my case, um, think that interest rates are high. The 50-year average is 7.9%, so we're not even there to an average yet. We had an anomaly for five years of these low interest rates. But I bought my first house at 7.5. I bought my next house at 12.5. I sold houses at 17.5. People still need houses no matter what the rate. So glad that the rate is slowing down. We are seeing it in the sixes right now. It may get to the sevens before all is said and done, but there are some really great benefits right now. Um, 
that I wanted to talk to you about for anybody you know who might be buying a house. I know you're probably not looking to buy a house, but I also know you may know people that are. So the legislator just passed a plan that goes into effect in July for first time home buyers. New construction, 450,000 or less. They're going to allow them $20,000 interest free to either use as a down payment, closing costs, or to buy down their interest rate. By the way, we had a deal closed last week where they bought down the interest rate for $10,000 and closed at 4.78%. It's still doable to get those lower rates. So I really want you thinking this, this program doesn't go into effect until July. And they pay the money back to that plan when they sell. If they never sell, they never pay it back. They owe nothing. So I want you to think about between now and July, who you know that I should be talking to to tap into $20,000 of free money. Can you do that for me, Greg? Yeah. You'll call me when you think of somebody, maybe one of the grandkids. Okay, perfect. Okay. You could be having that conversation. Another conversation that, and by the way, the other benefits are, you know, prices, prices are down about 16% from the high. Now, keep in mind, the high had gone up for 11 years straight. The high the previous year had gone up 27%. How many in people's income went up 27% that year? Like zero, okay? So that 16% still puts them 9% higher in an equity position in the last two years than they would have been. And right now there's more houses to choose from. You know, a year ago, it was a race. There'd be 10, 20, 30, 40 offers on every house. Now the buyers actually have some choices. And in some cases, the sellers are happy to pay concessions to get them that interest rate buy down. So really, this is a great time to be looking to buy a house. I'll ask you another question because sometimes people say to me, well, we're worried about a recession. You may heard that one yet. Okay. So I've, I've heard that one. And so I always say to them, I'm doing this with Greg. So Greg, you mean like in 2008? Okay, the Great Recession. Yeah. So that time is not like this time. Can I tell you why? Sure. Okay. So 93% of all people have a, an interest rate under 5% right now. So nobody's at a high rate that they have to sell. Unemployment is still at 2% not high. Buyers have had to qualify for their loans back in 2008. All they had to do was fog a mirror. Matter of fact, if they could fog the mirror twice, they could buy two, even if they couldn't qualify for either. Not kidding. Foreclosure rates are almost non-existent. They're at 1% right now. So that time is not like this time. And I'll also tell you, I have a lot of clients who bought in 2008 at the height of the market before the crash, there's not a one of them that's sad that they bought. That investment has paid well for them. Okay? All right. What other conversations could you have? You're going to be coming up um, in July, and we've talked about this here before. I do a lot of protesting of taxes for my clients. Although this, uh, you get a tax notice Everybody gets their tax notice in July and they have until September 15th to protest them. So August is the time I do that. And then I do hearings. And so I had four hearings two weeks ago that I went to, but four is nothing for me. I mean, I'm, I protested as high as 80 people in a single year, but last year, because the prices had gone up and it was feeding frenzies, I had to say no to almost everyone who wanted theirs done, because I couldn't find any comps. So guess what? I think this year I'm going to be able to help people because the market is adjusting. So I think that'll make it easier. And that's something I do free of charge and it's wonderful. Now, one of our agents, Liz, called me up uh, earlier this week. 
um, I taught Lizzie how to do this last year and she had somebody that she did and she had some questions on it. So I came and helped her. She called me up to say uh, she had done the hearing and they just got their results and she saved them over $1,000. Now, next year when Lizzie's calling and she says, you know, I help people protest their taxes that are in my VIP club. There's no cost to that. Last year, I helped one of my clients save $1,000. Would you like me to help you? Yeah. Say no, to that. no. And do they remember for all time and eternity that you saved them $1,000? Yeah. So what if we're just having the conversation now about, hey, don't. Don't forget, you want to put in your calendar July 30th, you want to call me. Circle that date, put a reminder in your phone because I'll help you protest your taxes if they come in too high. It's one of the services I provide because you're in my VIP club. But you got to call me if you want my help. Can you do that? What about that? Okay. We have to provide them with three sold comps that say their value is higher than what we think it should be. And so, um, Dean, you should put on your calendar in May to book me in June to come out and I'll just do a protesting your taxes class. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Dean. yeah. <laughs> But put that in your on your watch. Put that on your watch now for call Lee in May. Okay. All right. So that'll be a whole nother class. Anything else that you've been calling your SOI about? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a Rolodex. Some of you who are young don't know what those are. It's this little round wheel thing that I put business cards in and I have them alphabetized. And so when you need a painter or plumber, an electrician, a landscaper and all that, I just go through my Rolodex and I can refer somebody to you. Okay. Um, so that's a really great one because this is kind of the time to do that. So speaking of timing, um, what are the biggest listing months along the Wasatch Front? Say it loud. April, May, and June. Every year, it doesn't matter. April, May, and June. Okay? By the way, and can I finish one sentence? By the way, if you go back and look at last May and any other May for the last 40 years or so, you will find that the highest priced houses closed in May. They typically went on the market in April. Closed in May, that'll be your highest price. Why would that be? Because more houses came on in May, more came on in June. It's a supply and demand. The more listing choices they have, the softer the prices, the less choices they have, the higher the prices. So for my clients, I try to get them on listed in February, out in March, uh, just because that gets them a higher price. And I'm happy to explain that to them the summer before. Okay, hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say, when is a good time to sell your house? Well, right now is the best time to sell your house. Uh, when you need to sell your house, it doesn't matter. But the data shows that springtime, like you mentioned, there is every month that people are getting the most for their house. Mm -hmm. And that is? April. It'll be April. Yep. Yeah. I'll pretty much guarantee it, guys. It's been that way every single year, no matter what the market. Okay. Now, when, um, so by the way, if you're making calls right now to your SOI, which I hope that you are, what would you want to be having conversations about? It's not a trick question. Great. I'd want to be having conversations about selling your house. If there was a time to do it, this would be the time to put it on the market because they're thinking about it anyways. Okay. Now, when are your biggest buying months? Say it. Nope. Although December is like, December is a good month. Um, it is actually May, June, and August 
are your three biggest buyer months. Okay. So if a, if a person lives in a house and they're thinking about downsizing or upsizing, um, is new construction appealing to them? Many times it is. When do you find out they're thinking about that? Unfortunately, after they probably signed up with the builder to build a house. So would not this be a good time to call people or send out an email or um, text? Not all, not all builders are created equal. Call me if you'd like my list of the top 10 builders. Because now you'd find out they're thinking about doing that. So you could accompany them to these builders. You can get them doing their house, getting it prepped, rather than waiting for, they'll wait till 30 days before the house is done and then call and go, oh, good news, we're moving into a new house. It'll be done in a month. I need to sell mine. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah, you know, my clients have lived in their houses 30, 40, 50 years. You know how much stuff has to be done when you've lived that long in a house? I want my people talking to me six months before they're ready to sell because we have stuff we have to do to get ready. By the way, difference in the market, change in the market. When the market was a sprint, feeding frenzy, I didn't, my sellers didn't have to do diddly squat. Right now in this market, what do they have to do? All the squat, every bit of it, okay? Every bit of it, okay? So that's a definite change in the market. How many of you are using virtual staging? Just me? Okay. So I just had one where this guy bought it when he was in college. So it became kind of the college guy's house. So I said, could you move all the furniture out? Because it was college guy kind of furniture. I have some people that are just listed that are moving their stuff today in the snowstorm. Um, out of their house in uh, North Ogden and they had lovely stuff, but they had moved some of it to their other house in St. George where they're now going to be permanently. So it was a half filled house, not fully filled. No, pictures weren't, I'd already been moved to St. George. And I said, could you just move everything? And I'm just going to have it virtually staged. So, you know, versus having a stager come in, you know, that's going to cost me Twelve hundred to four thousand dollars. Not me, my seller. I don't pay for the staging. Um, but now I can virtually stage it, where I have my photographer just virtually stage the main rooms, the kitchen, the great room, the master. Maybe I'll do another room or two, depending on the house. And that cost me forty-five dollars a room. So virtually staging, because when you look and not just you buyers, when they look at houses and they're just nothing in the house. You have rectangular rooms that you don't get to see a 360 typically. And you're just not sure how big that really is. And will that fit? In other words, buyers have no imaginations. So if you can stage it, then they go, oh, that would be cool. Plus I can stage it to probably be more hip, more cool than Greg's furniture. Okay. Any type of disclaimer in the virtual staging? I haven't. I mean, if I have a house that I take pictures of and my seller moves, do I need to do a disclaimer that the house is now empty? Isn't the only reason I have it on the MLS is to do what? Get people to come to the house. They don't have a problem figuring out the geographics of their furniture when the house is empty. It's just on the pictures that they don't come and see the house because they can't figure it out on the picture. Dean. And then number two, if the staging doesn't change the structure of the, the virtual staging, does it change the structure of the home? There's been some bad virtual staging kind of like over walls and we'll see. So who's not? Okay. So that that has to be part of the disclaimer. Okay. But otherwise, like you said. Yeah, I'm not moving anything. It's it is what it is. Greg? But if you're doing an open purpose, bring a lawn chair. No, bring a lawn chair. Empty bring a lawn chair. Now, do I have some houses that I might choose to stage? Yes. Um, some of my high-end luxury ones, 
if it's empty, or partially empty, I probably will do a stager. Um, but for the average home, no. Not we, another question is for you all. I heard, had lunch yesterday with an agent from another company, an old friend of mine, and uh, he lives in Traverse Mountain. And he said the layoffs from Silicon have been huge. So has anybody done anything about that? Has that impacted how you're doing your business at all? Okay. That seems foolish. Okay. Just saying, there's an opportunity there. Why are you not taking advantage of that opportunity? Well, you probably won't do it. Probably won't go do it anyways. Okay. So can you get a call list from someplace? A scrub list that you can make phone calls? Because right now door knocking up there today is not going to be pleasant. Okay. But if you can call them and say, hey, we've got buyers looking in your area. Does anybody have a buyer that's looking in Lehigh? Okay. So not a lie. All right. Who do you know who may be making a move? Aren't those people more likely? It's kind of like upstairs at Real Advantage Title. They can give you a list of an area and tell you who the renters are. So when are my biggest selling months, buy, buying months? May, June, August. So would it not seem that door knocking or calling the people who are marked as renters is a more likely person to buy a house? Is that person maybe going to be a first time home buyer and maybe be wanting to take advantage of that 20,000 free money? Should I go and maybe tell them about that? So I need you to think about your opportunities as they arrive. There are some out there. Are you looking for them? And then more importantly, are you acting on them? I lead a rising star mastermind in my market center, which is the new agents, the people who've just gotten started. We meet once a month. And so we've been working on building our database and calling our database. And so I featured uh, Lisa this, this week when I sent up my email reminder that our next meeting is coming up. And I said, Lisa's just been such a good implementer. So I think that ideas like I'm giving you are a dime a dozen. Who I worship are implementers. Those of you who take what I've said and go do something about it. So Lisa is a great example. So last week, Lisa had a stellar week. She was calling her SOI, ended up setting three appointments with buyers. She's already put one under contract, signed one of them in a buyer broker agreement. The third one is not yet in for their appointment. She then also got one listing. She then also, this is all SOI. She then also did an open house, picked up the buyer there, got them signed. So all of that in one week because she's a master implementer. So I'm not here for your entertainment. I'm not that funny. I'm here to give you ideas and ask you to go implement them, which can feel awkward, but really they don't know what you're gonna say. So just go and say it. And you know, if you're like Chris and you're new, then great, role play what you're gonna say or go out with somebody else and Chris takes this side of the road and somebody else takes that side of the road. And at the end of the block, you check and see how that's going with each other. But you know some targeted areas that you should be working on and yet you're not working on them yet. Now, there may be other areas where we have the same challenge for people who are in losing jobs on the silicone slopes, but uh, I know Travis Mountain definitely. That's the case. Okay. All right. Um, so all I'm saying on the timing thing is remember what the timing is. People who decide to build homes, it's typically April. I think this year it's a little later because of the snow, but truthfully, Make sure your email goes out and says, if you'd like a list of the top 10, my favorite builders, top 10 best builders, whatever you want to call it, please reach out to me. Happy to share it. All builders are not created equal. 
and know that that's a way to get those people in and they all have a house to sell. Okay. Then think about door knocking. Think about the people who've lost their jobs. Think about when people are going to be buying and when people are going to be selling and do your marketing based on those things because they're already thinking about it. You'll be amazed if you made phone calls up there and we're talking with people about, have you thought about selling your house? We've got people that are really interested in the Traverse Mountain location. Um, you'll be amazed at how many will turn around and say, oh my gosh, we like talked about that at dinner last night. Because this is just the right time. So we'd want to do that. Okay. All right. Um, so those are some, and those still all happen with changes of the market. Part of that. Okay. Um, other questions on changes of the market? Other questions of things you can be doing? Let's look at one more thing. Um, how many people have a database that's in a computer in some format, like an Excel or Command or Top Producer or something? Raise your hands. Hi. Wonderful. How many people do you have in your database? Fine. Yeah. Uh, 700 or 800. I can't remember. Okay. 700 or 800. And so um, if those 700 or 800, if I say your name, they know who I'm talking about. Yes. Fine. Yeah. Pardon? No one knows me, but her, yes. Why am I talking to you? No, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he knows the thing. So. Okay. So seven or 800. So if I say your name, they know who I'm talking yeah. about. Okay. Fabulous. And so you have them in what kind of database? What? what? Um, we have them in command. In command. Great. And have you pushed a smart plan start button? Uh, we, yes, that's how we do our monthly meetings. Okay. And so it's contacting them how often? Uh, twice a month, email wise. Okay. And then what else are you doing? So 24 touches by email to a month. So they're at 24 touches. How else? Uh, with postcards. Okay. So now she's at 36 because she gets a monthly postcard. So she's at a 36 touch. What else? And then we do an event every other month. And then we do an event every other month. So there's some face-to-face. -face. What else? Um, I think that's it. Oh, we do birthday cards and home anniversary cards. Okay. Birthday cards and home anniversary cards. So are the number of touches that my two Bs are doing, I can't remember their names, but they both start with B. Okay. Is that an adequate amount of touches? Sure. Okay. What rate of return should she get then? Two and 12. Yep. So, so two and 12 gives me how many a year? 18, right? I don't know. Well, 18 per, or 12 per hundred. And a 12 per hundred. And you have 700. All right, let's just take, let's do it. The, oh, sorry. Right. So they're at 700 people. They get two for 12. So, so one, one, what is that? How many is that? 116 closings. Okay. Um, except she's not doing the most important one. At least she didn't tell us she was. So 116 divided by two is 58. Because here's the challenge. Is it even that? No, it's one, it's, yeah, that's it. So the challenge is if you're not making your four phone calls and talking to them, Leaving a message doesn't count. By the way, you have events and they come. But the challenge is at the event, they may be talking about pumpkins. I mean, or something. But it's probably not the script that you want to have to teach them how to send your referrals and check in on them, right? Okay. Um, so if you're not doing those four phone calls, then your rate is one in every 50. Huge difference, guys. Huge difference. It's the number one, well, it's the number two mistake. Number one mistake is they don't have them in a smart plan, okay? And the bees have the smart plan. 
the number two mistake is they don't make the calls. So that's why we're spending that time talking about what are you saying when you're talking to people? Because otherwise you're not going to have that. Okay. Now, if you've got 700 people, 700 divided by 60 is how much? Somebody help me. 11-ish. Okay. So they need to talk to 11-ish people a day, five days a week. And that will get them through four phone calls a year. If they talk to 11-ish, not leave messages, not text, okay, talk to. Okay. Now, if they're not home, what do you say when you, because they have a message machine that comes on, what do you say? We've talked about this in a previous class. If you're leaving a message, you can't just say, hey, Craig, this is Lee. Give me a call when you've got a minute. I need to talk to you. Greg likes me, but, you know, days will happen and he'll just not remember and life goes on and he forgets. But if I call Greg and I say, hey, Greg, it's Lee. Hey, um, pretty important I talk to you. Matter of fact, call me on my cell phone. Yeah, 801-541-5899. Now, is Greg more likely to call me on that one? Why? It felt important and it's a herky-jerky message. It's this start and stop kind of in the conversation, but it creates a importance to the call. So please make sure you use a herky-jerky message and then you will actually get them to call you back. But if not, they probably won't. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk about, is anybody getting, how many of you have been on a listing appointment in the last 30 days? Okay, good. Um, have we had any objections that are different in this market than what you'd had previously? And if you're newer in the business, then you probably didn't because Today is the only day you know, and that's fabulous. You're lucky. Yes. Um, I've been having quite a few where they thought it was worth more than what it's actually worth. Okay, worth more than what it's actually worth. Okay. Um, anybody else have any others? Nothing that you didn't expect and could overcome? My goodness, you all are good. I like that. Okay. Getting a job. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to cost something. Yeah. So, um, they're all in love with their interest rate. So we'll talk about that one also, because I am getting that one too. Okay, so they think it's worth more than it is. How many of you are going out with a CMA done? Okay, so I've stopped doing that. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, guys. I'm just saying that's what I'm doing. How many are you using um, recent solds as your comps? On the markets and actives. Yeah. Yeah, if you pull your solds from the last 90 days, no more than that. Um, so I pull up the solds for the last 90 days. And that's in one section of my scene or one section of my book. And I tell them, let me give you a little history lesson about what's happened in the past. And that's my sold in the last 90 days. And then I do exactly what Greg does. I pulled the under contracts and I have that's in another section. Let me tell you what's happening right now. And we don't know what those prices are because I haven't closed yet. Sometimes I will get hold of the agent and say, hey, Brooke, I'm using your uh, sold as a comp and really hoping maybe you can give me an idea of where you guys ended up landing on that. And half the time, if I tell him I'm using it for that, he'll go ahead and tell me. Sometimes they won't. I'll just say, fine, when is it going to close? Because I think it'll be one the appraiser will use. They'll tell me that. Um, so I tell them what's happening now. But if we're going to list the house, we need to know what's happening in a couple of weeks after we got the photos done and we're ready to go on the market, right? So. How many houses are we seeing now that are available for sale? In a lot of cases, a lot more than we used to. My one in North Ogden, there were like five or seven, quite a few in that neighborhood. Okay. Um, I just did one up in the avenues 
And there's nothing for sale in the avenues, not one thing. I mean, we'll, we'll get top dollar on that for sure. So the reality is I think how we do the CMA is different. Now I take pictures and print the pictures, internal pictures of the house. So that when I go, we talk about history and we talk about what's happening right now and what's going to happen. And we look at the pictures because I, I don't do a two-stepper do most of the time. If it's a luxury home, I do a two-stepper. But if it's not a luxury home and it's in a regular neighborhood, I can probably just go out to Greg's house and probably be, be pretty safe of just looking at it. But when we go through it then, after we walk through the house, I'm going to say, Greg, let's look at these. And you tell me, I brought pictures for you. So you can tell me which one's like your house, worse than your house, better than your house. You help me do this, okay? And we go through it. And we decide on the price here. Now, the challenge you have, oh, she left on the important part. So the challenge you have is, let's say we get there and we say it's 500,000. She thinks it's how much? Or thinks it's how much? Probably 550. 550, okay. All right, wonderful. So when you were thinking about your pricing, tell me how you arrived at the 550. Uh, looking at Zillow. Looking at Zillow, yeah. So we're a non-disclosure state in Utah. So Zillow is right or wrong 100% of the time because we are a non-disclosure. It's not just a Zillow thing. We're just a non-disclosure state. So looking at what is sold, which is what a buyer is going to look at, and more importantly, what an appraiser is going to look at, these are the most recent solds. These are the ones that are under contract that are going to be the appraiser's number one houses to use for years. So if you were a buyer right now and you fell in love with this house, because it's a cool house and you want to write an offer on it, your agent's going to take you back. They're going to look at this, pull this information up. And so I'm not going to lay it in front of you and I'm going to go, okay, they're asking 550. Here are where the comps come in. How much you can offer on this house? Not 550. But if I said to you, yeah, but it's listed at 550, how much more? No. There wouldn't change anything. But if I explained to you that they really had to have 550, how much more would you offer? maybe 505 right so where do we need to be priced here right at the market value at five mm -hmm. yeah smart okay that's all i do on that i make them answer the questions them be the buyer and if you've got the pictures there you can do that the other thing i do is i always have my listing presentation filled out except for one thing the price and i make them write that price down on my listing on the data entry sheet because I don't want them to feel like I convinced them or anything else. They're writing it down. Okay. So where I used to years ago come with the columns and it all done, I am not doing that right now because the market is changing fast enough that I feel like it's easier for me to be able to explain and let them be part of that decision-making process, understanding that the market is changing. That makes sense? Okay, you'll explain all that to her, right? Okay. All right, perfect. Um, so let's talk about the one Brooke mentioned, and that is that they're in love with their interest rate. Um, you know, and Brooke, I can sure understand that. I mean, 93% of the Americans right now have interest rates that are below 5%. So there are a lot of people in love with their interest rate. Um, the, the challenge I ask is, if you decide not to sell, are you in love with your house? Okay, so if you're not in love with your house, then we probably have a couple of options. So the first option would be, um, can we keep this house as a rental? And we could find that out by simply checking with property managers, see what the rents would be, and then calling my lender and let's see what you could qualify for. And I have to tell you ahead of time, most people can qualify for two house payments. So don't be upset if that's the case, but I think it's worth checking out. Should we do that? Yeah. Okay. So that is the first step. And I just did that on one and they do qualify and we are not going to sell the house. They're going to keep it. And I'll just help them buy their next house. Okay. On the other hand, there are a lot of people that can't do that. And so then it goes back to, do you love your interest rate? Let's say you didn't qualify. 
Now we got to ask the other question. Do you love your interest rate or your family more? Okay. I can relate to that, but the reality is if this house isn't going to work for your family moving forward, then let's go find a great house. And remember, you only commit to the price. The interest rate can be temporary. You're not marrying the interest rate. If rates go down, you refinance it. So when I bought one at seven and a half percent, my first house, I didn't keep a seven and a half percent interest rate. My second one was 12 and a half percent. I didn't keep that one for very long either. So we're only going to date the interest rate for a while, but we're going to lock in your housing while you can, while there's three times as many choices as there was a year ago. Okay? You love the family the most. Prices are lower, 16% lower than a year ago. So let's secure the housing. We'll just date the rate for a while. Okay? That makes sense? Okay. What other objections? Any others that you're getting? So on all of you who raised your hands, did all of you take that listing? Some of you will have, some of you would not. And I know this, this has to be a safe space and I promise I won't make fun of you because it really does need to be a safe space. Like I just told you about Lincoln and the fact that we listed it, ultimately he can qualify for keeping it as a rental. So we released the listing before I ever did a grand opening. I did pictures, so I'm out of pocket, but I don't care. That was the best thing for Lincoln. So I'm not getting that listing. I got it. Now we're releasing it. What caused you to not take the one you were on? Were there multiple agents going out and seeing them? Are they just not ready yet? What were the reasons on the ones you didn't take in the last 30 days? Be brave. They wanted to find the house that they're going to buy before they'll be ready to sell. Okay. So they want to find the perfect house before they can buy the perfect house. Anybody else ever have that one? <laughs> All day long, right? It's everybody's perfect dream. Um, so what I'm hearing you say, Colleen, so what I'm hearing you say, Colleen, is that you don't want to be homeless. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. You want to kind of go driveway to driveway, right? Okay. So I'm going to make a suggestion to you. First, I'm going to suggest that you and I go out on a dating day, not a day to buy just a dating day. And we go out and look to see, are there houses out on the market that honestly you would be interested in having? Okay? Because if there isn't, then staying where you're at may be what you have to do for the time being. But if there is, then I want you to have some peace of mind that there will be something out there. Won't be the thing you saw that day probably because you're not ready to put yours on the market yet. But I will promise I will not let you be homeless. Nobody's ever been homeless in 50 years with me. So you're not going to be my first. Okay. The challenge you have is if you wait and find something, unless you can go out and get a mortgage on this house to buy that house. And if you owe nothing, that might be an option. Could we do that? Yes. Okay. If we could do that, then honestly, I don't need to sell her house first, do I? I don't. So let's meet with your, a lender. Let's see about getting a bridge or home equity loan or whatever on this house, get it in place. And then let's honestly just go out and find your house. Well, I don't want to go into, I want to switch this house for what it's going to sell for. I want to buy the other house at the exact same price. I don't want to go $10 in debt because I own this one. Yeah. So I need to have other house. So I, you can tell me what this is going to sell for. Then when I find that house at that price, it has everything I want. Right. Then I'll sell it. Buy. Right. Are we downsizing, upsizing, or same sizing? Downsizing. Downsizing. Okay. And how old is your house, Colleen? Uh, built in 86. Okay. Good. And uh, 
just not asking you at the point, but uh, if you were prior to meeting me, and I know that my job is to come up with a dollar amount, in your mind, you had a dollar amount for this house figured out. And I'm going to ask you what that is for our story problem. So what is that? What do you think it's going to sell for? Well, the house I want to buy is one million fifty thousand. So I want this house to sell for one million fifty thousand. And do you think it's worth one million fifty thousand? I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll go do the work, but I don't think so. Have you had any house in your neighborhood sell for one million five hundred thousand? Yeah, well, no, but we have right. a four car RV garage and yep. on an acre. Yep. And a lot, it's a lot of lawn to mow. <laughs> That's the reason we're still I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. And for somebody who's got a lot of toys, that's great and a lot of lawn to mow. But the reality is, nobody in your neighborhood is sold for me and five. Correct. So because you want it doesn't make it true. Uh, because you want it does not make a buyer pay more for your house. So you've picked another house at 1.5. To me, Colleen, that does not sound like downsizing. Correct. So maybe we need to reevaluate what downsizing and why you're downsizing really looks like. So there's a whole long conversation that needs to be going on. But you'll notice with me, I'm just going to honest, be honest with her about things right from the get-go, if we allow them, when you talk about creating expectations for sellers, if, if we spend a lot of time agreeing with them, aren't we helping them set unrealistic expectations? Mm -hmm. And so you can't do that, guys. You have to be, bring them into earth, Okay. Now she and I probably now will go out on a dating day because how old are you? 60. Right. At 60, do you really want to be in debt? Do you really want to vacuum $1.5 million worth of house at age 60? I mean, I would think at 60, you're thinking more about things like where could we travel? What family things could we do? I wouldn't want to be going into that large a space. How big is that house that you're looking at that you love for a million five? 4,400 square feet. Okay. At my age, I'm 70, so I've got you. There's no way at 70, I was spending that kind of money. Do you? Do you? Oh, well, I don't know. I, I'm looking for the house that's going to be, that I really want. If it comes up, that's what I want to do. Otherwise, I'm thinking about remodeling this house. Putting okay. the money I would pay to put the big RV garage in the other one. Okay. I would just pick this one. Wonderful. So let's do this. Let's do a dating day and let's go see what else is on the market. This will give me opportunity to see what she really needs, what's important to her, how she's going to use the space. Um, and also rein her in because at 60... Why would she be spending a million five? And she's not because she wants to get, she wants to pay cash and go from a 1986 house into a million five. Um, the other thing is we do need to figure out how much she could sell the house for in its current condition and how much it'd be worth remodeled. And we also need to have those two conversations. Okay. So, and so she's going to need a major reality check. But I'm not going to agree with her from the get-go and give her unrealistic expectations even from the beginning. I'm going to take a pretty hard approach on it and say, let's go discover. But are you thinking? I mean, I have a client that I sold his house. I've sold two houses or three houses for them. And they were going to downsize. And they called me from a restaurant after meeting with their financial planner and said, we need to get out of the house we're in um, and go to something smaller. And our financial planner says, that's what we need to do is we downsize. I'm going to be retiring this next year and blah, blah, blah. And so I referred him to one of the agents on my team to do the buying and I was going to do the selling. And my agent called me and said, you know, they're having me look at houses that have stairs. They're having me look at houses with three-car garages and apartments in the basement. And I said, okay. So 
meet meet me over at my neighborhood and I'm going to show them one in my neighborhood not to buy it was a listing I had coming up. But I said, let me show you how to handle this. Um, because she was allowing him unrealistic expectations. So when they came and we were out in the driveway, um, I said to them before we even opened up the house, I said, so um, Jackie says you've been looking at houses with stairs. You haven't really, have you? <laughs> and I said, Linda, you are 72 years old. You can do stairs today. What happens when you're 82? 10 years down the road. I thought we agreed. No stairs, single level. Yeah. And I said, and I'm sorry, Travis is going to live with you forever, son, which is wonderful. It's, it's a great relationship. It's not crazy or anything. It really is an anomaly, a, a, a weird one that I actually agree with for both sides. But I said, Travis is going to have a vested. He's going to, he's the only child. He's going to inherit your house at some point. He can pay for the apartment in the basement. We do not need a house with an apartment already done. He can put in a kitchen and a bedroom and a family room and a bathroom. Can you not do that, Travis? Because Travis is there. And Travis is like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you work a full-time job. He's got a good job. You could do that, right? And you're not paying rent. So you pay for your space, right? Yeah. I pay for my space. I mean, chess came out. Yeah, I can do that. And I said, okay. And am I remembering, correct me, you called me from a restaurant after your financial planner and the financial planner said, you need to reduce your housing costs. Isn't that correct? Yes. Then what are you doing? All the stuff you told me, you're misbehaving. And I said, so I'm going to show you this one now because this it's not, you can't even buy it, but it's one I'm listing and it's what you could buy in the price point you wanted to buy, which I think was like 450, 485,000 and see if this will work for you. So we walked in and Jackie said, they always go down in the basement first where Travis, it was going to be Travis was the most important part. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. So we're going to go out on the back patio. So follow me. And we walked right through the house, out the back door and stood on the back deck. We did not go to the basement. And we looked at the upstairs of the house. Then we went to the basement. Then they bought that house. Okay which I didn't think my sellers would do, but they did. So um, all I'm saying is, are you controlling what's going on? And was that harsh of me? I don't think it was because they called me from a restaurant as soon as they left their financial planner. They counted on me to help them achieve the goals that they and their financial planner decided they needed to do for him to be able to retire early this next year. He's already retired now and he plays golf five days a week. He has a wonderful life. And they counted on that for me, from me. Are you remembering to care about your clients enough to have the conversations that are not necessarily easy? I mean, at 60, do I have clients that should be out spending a million five? A few, but not the norm. So I got to at least question it. Downsizing to a million five doesn't sound like a downsize to me. Maybe it is. If, she, if I found out I went to her house and she had an 8,000 square foot house, all right, then I'm wrong. Going down to 4,400 is downsizing. I can live with that. Not sure I can live with a million five, but maybe she can. Okay. How did I get on that topic? <laughs> I don't know. Setting expectations. Um, other ones that we've heard recently. Um, we've done the one, the current rate is so low on my interest rate. Um, I don't want to be in the higher one, the one Brooke brought up. Um, to get what we want, we have to move to the location where we don't really want to live. What should we do? If you heard that one in my price point, I'd have to be, you know, someplace else. 
doing a dating day and, and just saying to them, you may be right. You may be right. It may be that you have to stay right here. But the question I have to ask you, now you have three kids, is this house going to be big enough for you? No. So really saying here isn't the long-term plan. So let's do this, and I don't mind. Let's set up a dating day, not a day to go buy something. Matter of fact, leave your checkbook at home. We're not buying. Let's go out on an adventure and see what some other options might be. So I just did that and closed on one this month for Sandina, the one who sent me the referral last night of Chip. Okay, that was Sandina. So Sandina didn't want to go over 600000 And in Salt Lake, where she lives, she and Andy live, 600000 wasn't buying her what she needed. So I bought her a brand new house with Perry Homes out in Stansbury Park that is gorgeous for 600000 Okay? So all I'm saying is sometimes going out on an adventure without your checkbook, and let's look at what some other places might be. When there's no pressure to it, then it becomes easier. But you've got to get them to acknowledge that now with three kids, can you stay? And they really can't. Yeah, go ahead. Um, how much time do you give to that kind of situation? Because that could take all so much time for one family. They're going to do this. And then you're going to do for the next family, the next family. You know, there's a lot of clients. Do you give yourself a boundary of like how many homes you're going to see with this person? Well, it's one day. Half, maybe five hours. It is one day. Yeah. How many buyers do you have at any given time? A couple, I don't know. Okay. So we're really not talking about every day of the week. But, and it's like I said, it's a one time. With Sandina, the checkbook was at home. We weren't going to buy. We did buy, but we weren't going to buy. So that was the only day I took them out. Period. Do you also um, take them to places that they've said, no, absolutely not? Because usually people are saying those things because of what they preconceived right. you know, pre right. notions about where things are. Exactly. So that's why I said we're going on an adventure. So you're going to have an open mind. We're going to look at some pockets of areas that I think might be interesting for you. So you okay with an adventure? We're not buying anything. You okay with an adventure? And because it's an adventure... And I say, okay, now we're going to go to West Valley. Well, I don't want West Valley. No, no, no. We're going to go look at this pocket in West Valley that's kind of sweet. And we're just on adventure, not buying it. Let's go. Curiosity. Okay. Yeah. Takes all the pressure off, guys. Okay. All right. So then uh, another one that we're seeing, um, waiting till the rates go down. We kind of covered that on the one I did with Brooke. You're just dating the interest rate, you don't have to live with it forever, but you are locking in the house and locking in that price. Um, news about the housing crash, is this like that time? That's the one I did with Greg. Um, inflation, which I think, I don't know if that's the same as some of the others we've done. Um, I think for me on inflation, Prices are down 16%. And the economists, the local economists think we'll still be down another 5% this year. Which would put me in a negative or a positive from two years ago. Pardon? Positive. Positive from the year before, it would still put me up 1%. Okay. Um, the area I live in rarely has anything available to buy. That's kind of Colleen's, where she's got a certain area or a certain house that she wants. And so going out on a dating day and exploring a few options is probably the best way to know um, where we need to be on that one. Um, what about I don't have 20%, I don't have enough for a down payment? You ever get that one? Okay. How do you handle it? So he weeps bitterly and then points him to a mortgage officer. Uh, yeah, I've had people where, you know, where if they're getting married, I'm saying instead of gifts for the wedding, 
open an account and ask people to make donations to the Let's Buy Our First House account. Or let's plug into that 20,000 coming up in July. Because mostly the people who don't have any money are first time home buyers. Everybody else who owns a house, they still have some equity, almost every case. Okay. So I would put them right into there. Are there loans that you can do with, you know, no money down? I think there are. Most of them are 3% down, but most, I mean, I think there are some that you can get no money down. Um, Rural is still some places in Utah County, right? Like Eagle Mountain, maybe, or They're getting parts of Saratoga. Saratoga and Eagle Mountain. They're getting reevaluated this year. Okay. So, right now, yes. That's good because I'm listing one in Eagle Mountain on Tuesday. It's a condo, 325, all decked out. I think you all should sell it for me, please. Okay. Um, referral from a builder. Okay. Um, renting allows me to save money uh, and I don't have to do things like replace the water heater. My landlord does that for me. You get any of those? Okay, we'll skip that one. Um, you've got you've got that one. That's Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so I have that one on my avenues one where that's why, and I, I've sold, I sold his last house and we helped him buy the house he's in. He's a doctor and they're um, going to go to Jackson Hall, which they can't afford. So they'll probably go over to Rexburg and um, looks for something there. And they're just, they're not positive. They're going to love it there. And if they don't, they want to come back. So we'll probably rent their big house in the avenues for a year and see, do they like it? Um, they will buy something in the other. Um, the challenge we've got is, have you checked on the rents up in Woods Cross? Is there anything available and what are the rents? Okay. Um, can we buy something and be in that same amount so you can rent it from yourself and then just keep that as a rental if you decide to move out of there? Not, not the home I want. Okay. Right. But you can rent the home you want for that price then? No, we're, it wouldn't be really what we want. Okay. It's just the cheaper rent. Okay. So why don't we rent from ourselves? Yeah. So I'm a big believer in, you know, you're paying rent either to yourself and paying down your mortgage, or you're paying rent to somebody else and paying down their mortgage. And as long as you can buy something that you could then keep as a rental, then why don't you rent something for yourself by owning it? And then if you decide to move back to, where are they? Airman. Airman. So if you decide to move back to Airman, you've now got a Woods Cross rental. Because here's the truth. Prices are down right now. This is a good time to do it. And rents are mortgage payment. Truthfully, they are. Okay. That reminds me of another conversation that I'm hoping, because you have so many young buyers. I'm hoping you have this conversation often. Um, I delivered fudge um, a year ago in November to uh, Kathy and Don's house and was visiting with Kathy and asked her how her son, Matt, was doing. He had gotten out of college. And, and she said, oh, my gosh, he's engaged. And they're getting married in April. This was the last week of November. They're getting married in April, and they're saving for a house. And I said to her, be still my heart, honey. He can't outsave this market. I need to talk to him. So she had him call me the next day. So I met Matt and Megan and my conference room on Saturday with my loan officer. And I said, OK. So tell me what your plan is. Well, we're going to go rent something and save for a house. And I said, okay, how much are you going to have to pay for rent? And he said, $1,600. I said, okay, if we could find you something to buy and you rent it from yourself, it could be your first piece of wealth building. And here's why I think that's important. You're 20, he was 24. 
You're 24 years old. I don't really believe that you will have Social Security available to you when you turn 65. Do you? And he said, no, I don't think we will. I said, no, I don't think you will. I think they'll be out of money. Secondly, every place that has a pension is trying to get out of their pensions. So I don't think you can count on a pension. So here's what I think you have to count on is yourself to create your own wealth, to have your own retirement plan. And Megan said, well, I'm getting my master's. I'll be working for the school district. So I will have a teacher's pension. I said, Megan, you will have fabulous health insurance. That's what your teacher's pension is going to bring your family is fabulous health insurance. It's not going to bring you enough money to live on as a teacher. It's unfortunate, but my mother's a school teacher and you get great health care benefits, but not a lot of money. So I think you have to create your own wealth. So here's what I would suggest we do. I will go find something that you could rent from yourself for about $1,600 a month. And then when you are ready to move out of it, we'll keep it as a rental. And by the way, I think we should do this every year until you have children. And once the children start elementary school, I will stop bugging you about this. So I'd like you to buy and own about five houses before you children start elementary school. If you own five houses, by the time you're 55, you'll have not only the equity, but a steady, steady income stream monthly for your retirement. So I did. I found him a condo, three bedroom, two bath. It's $1,625. So it went $25 over and they're renting it from themselves. I expect them, and we put it in Matt's name only, which I plan on having Megan, who's now the full-blown school counselor with a great job and health benefits. Um, I'm going to see about getting them into the $20,000 plan in new construction and buy their next one this coming summer when that money comes out. Then they'll rent this one. And by the way, all I had to do is make sure I was putting them in a condo that does allow rentals. And now I'll move them into the next one that will be a temporary, about a year thing. And then I'm going to hit them up again. But they understood that plan and they understood why that might be important for them to think about. So as you all talk about the youth of your population here in Utah County, the reason you do all the family type parties are you remembering to have that conversation with every one of those youthful people? Because if you're not, you're not serving them very well. I think that's, you know, they don't teach it in high school. They don't teach it in college. They expect you to be the local economist. I think that's about their long-term, not their short-term. So I think having that, you know, if you're talking about SOI calls, this may be a good class to, or a good conversation to have as you're making your SOI calls. You know, if they're 35 or under, have that conversation. Because at 35, 30 years from now, they'll be 65. That's supposedly retirement age. What's their plan? Do they have one? How can you help them have one? Okay. All right. Um, why did you put the condo in Matt's name? Well, I put it in Matt's name because the goal is to have five houses before they kids start elementary school. I can only have so many Fannie Mae loans in a person's name. So I'll have some that will be in Matt's, some that will be in Megan's, and some that will be jointly. And so it was strategic. I didn't know about the 20,000. That wasn't out on the, on the playing field yet. Uh, but it was very strategic to just do it in his name. Because we are, anytime you're going to do that, guys, with your with a couple, and their goal is to have five or six or 10, or however many houses, you need to be thinking about how many. So if Brooke and I were married, we can have, I think it's four um, conventional loans in our name. So what happens when I want to buy the fifth one? I lock down some opportunities for financing. So that's why. 
Okay. Um, and by the way, the guy that talks about renting that doesn't have to want to change the water heater, um, you're paying a lot of money for that water heater at that rent. But here's the reality. I get that you don't like to change water heaters and cover those kinds of items. Let's put a $600 home warranty on your house, your existing property, and you can just renew that every year. And then when the water heater goes out or something, you can just call them and they'll do it. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh huh. Just said, and she's so mentally exhausted. I know, just you know, we did all this work through our house, ready to list. And she said, To be honest, I don't want to go. Yeah, like this five showings in six months. She said, Yeah, tell me your first name. So, Rich, boy, can I understand what you're saying? I gotta ask you, did that agent call and apologize for not keeping his commitment and helping you with his dreams? Yeah then honestly, I want to apologize on behalf of all realtors because you walk away from this thinking we are all like that. And we're not. There's a difference between ordinary and extraordinary. There's a reason that they were willing to take it at so little money because they're going to do so little. I'd love to sit down with you and just talk about the difference between ordinary and extraordinary. So that when the time comes and you are ready, you know the difference and you know that I'm there to offer extraordinary results. What time would be good for you, Tuesday or Thursday? Okay. When somebody has had a bad experience, please do apologize to them. You know, our clients, and I want you to remember this, when you go into their houses for buying or selling, they have a dream you are part of that dream fulfillment crew. If you can't help them get there, they have every right to not be happy. So let's make sure we keep our commitments and make dreams come true. But yeah, and the good news is the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is about 20 extra minutes. That's the really sad part. Doesn't take a lot to really be superior. Okay. But I don't blame them for that feeling. Well, it's the making the phone calls every Wednesday. You know, it's the advertising it in some other places that they didn't. They think if there's a billboard in an MLS, they've done their job. It's the fact that you're willing to do open houses or have houses, open houses every other weekend on their house expose it. Those are things that didn't happen before. So it doesn't take a lot to, to, to space yourself as way different from the experience they had. But it does start with an apology. Because they really do think all realtors are that way. I, my funny story from Monday, I took a listing that I was telling you about in North, North Ogden. And uh, it was a referral from another agent. Uh, down in St. George, relative of theirs. And so they don't know me from Adam. Matter of fact, the agent said they're probably going to review or probably meet with a few realtors. But as I'm doing my presentation, partway through, the wife got up and went and got two pens just quietly and laid one by him and one by her. And I'm like, oh, okay, I have the listing. Um, so we get all done. And I said, is there any move, reason that we should not go ahead and move forward? And I always ask that so that no is the answer because people like saying no. And um, he says, I got to tell you, and you're not going to like this, but you know, between realtors and used car salesmen, he, now this guy is 60, he's 10 years younger than me, um, used car salesman, it's been a lot of years since I've ever had anybody use the used car salesman. So that was fun for me. He said, I honestly think that you guys just wait, make way, way too much money. I mean, the real estate industry, I mean, 6%, that's a lot of money and you don't have to do much for it. And, um, you know, I just, I just think it's a lot. And I said, I smiled and I said, I hear you. I said, I remember when I was selling $43,000 houses, that was my average sales price. 
and I was making 6%. It was like nothing um, to feed my two kids on. And I said, and you know, it kind of reminds me that about a year ago, I met with Denise and Clayton, who didn't know me. They were a GLS lead. And when I came in, they said they had another realtor and blah, blah, blah. And Clayton, who's a scientist, said to me, you know, halfway through, he said, well, I, I think we can sell it ourselves. And I went, I know you can. Put up a sign. You'll have it sold in a week. The challenge you have, Clayton, I'll make you more money. Now I got a cancellation agreement that is part of my presentation always. And I said, I've got a cancellation agreement. Why don't we do this? If I don't bring you the offers, you I just turned off. Okay. Um, and he went, oh, and I said, yeah, seriously. Well, I sold his house for 250,000 more than he thought it was worth. I have now sold them another house for over a million. It was Heather Groom's house. Then they remodeled that and sold it like five months later. So I sold that. And so we were again over May. And then I sold them another house in Bountiful. All of this happened in 18 months. So I was telling him the story about Clayton, who said, I think I can sell it myself. And, and I said, and he did, or I, I sold it for 250000 I said, but the sad part is, uh, Ken, I can't say that to you. Not now. You're on a quiet little street that unless somebody's really on purpose, they don't even find your street. Not a single person's going to drive by accidentally. It's going to take soul marketing. And we don't have people lined up writing 30 and 40 offers a house. So I'm going to work my fanny off because we're in that kind of market. And we're not going to pay the other agent less than 3% because here's the deal. I want them bringing every buyer they have to your house. And he's like, oh, well, that makes sense. Okay. So seriously, how did I get on that? I don't know. I think that you asked me a question, didn't you? Oh, yeah, about the thing. Okay. Took me 20 minutes to get that done. <laughs> okay. Um, so the other one, I think the costs of houses are going to come down from here um, that you might get. Are they wrong? No, I think the high. Hey there, nice of you to join us. Late arriver. <laughs> um, I think that they're right. I think that they're saying it'll probably go down another 5%. Um, but the reality is they still have to have a place to live. So, I mean, if you can stay for another six months, maybe in six months, the prices will have hit bottom. But the challenge you have is you won't know they've hit bottom until they've already started going back up. And really, as I said, back in 2008, at the very top of the market in June of 2008, that was the top. The clients who bought in June of 2008, even though they paid absolute top dollar before the biggest recession ever, every one of them is happy they bought their house. So don't step over dollars to pick up nickels. You should be buying now. It may take us a while to find one, as you've already said, so we better be ready. Okay, all right, um, are we doing time-wise? Ooh, we're almost there. Um, I think those are the main ones. We, do you, you guys don't get any comments about the Great Salt Lake, do you? Do you? Okay, because um, we've started a couple, some of the agents, I haven't had this one yet, but a couple of the agents um, have had that comment about, gosh, we don't know if we should own property here. We don't know what's going to happen in Salt Lake Valley with the Great Salt Lake drying out, blah, blah, blah. And so my response to that is I'm very thankful that um, the Mormon Church has donated those shares that they recently did to help us with that. The other good news is that so far, the lake is up one foot nine inches, and that's before any melt this year. So I'm hoping with... Today, we hit the, they announced it this morning before I got in the car. Um, they hit, we are at a new 40 year high. We bit the, or beat the uh, 1983 snow melt or snow, yeah, snow um, thing. So I think that'll be going up. But, and the other good thing is that the legislature and the population have joined hands and are both worried about it. 
So I believe a plan will come. I don't know what the plan is. But I also know that if I was in Florida, I have to worry about hurricanes. If I'm in California, it's earthquakes. If I'm in Indiana, it's tornadoes. There's really not many places on earth that don't have some sort of natural disaster kind of thing. I'm hoping we can fix ours. That seems to have been okay. All right. So um, changing of the market. Any other questions about that? Or have we covered that pretty well? Um, I, I'm going to believe the economists that it'll probably go down another 5%. I believe that we will find ourselves in a um, time, and it, I don't think it'll be the end of the year. I think it'll be the beginning of next year where we're going to see interest rates being at about five, five and a half, and that will become the new norm is my belief. Um, I don't believe in my lifetime, but I'm 70. So I don't believe in my lifetime we'll ever see a three. I am not certain we will even see anything in the fours. I really do, having done this for 50, almost 51 years, believe that we had an anomaly. We had never had it in my life prior to that five-year batch of low rates. And it's unfortunate because youngsters like you, that's all you knew. So it feels like that should be there. But the reality is, it was just five years. You're how old? 30 Sure. So the other 25 of years, it wasn't that. Okay. It was closer to 7.9 or eight. Okay. So that's, that's what I kind of see happening. Uh, we have an inventory shortage, no doubt about it. We're still a growth state, second in the nation. I think we're still a cool place to live. I think we have such a great economy, fiscally sound state, and we have very good economic development people in the, in the state, the counties, and the cities that I think we will continue to grow. So I think we are a great place to invest and own here. So I see nothing but good stuff. I saw a hand up. Yes. Where do you see home prices going? And what's your take on the prices of homes right now with the uh, where interest rates have been the last year. So you want to think it's about that. Um, so I'm going to. So if I'm hitting the right side or what? So if we take, how old are you? 33. 33. So how long ago was that? Would have been 1988. 89, yep. And so here we are at 2023. Okay. Um, so truthfully, if I look at home prices, I can pretty much count on all of my life and yours that we'll see a 4% per year appreciation. Doesn't really matter what the rates are, okay? So that being said, I'm gonna go from here and just pretend that's a 4% line. I don't know if it is or it isn't, okay? But truthfully, back in, um, when you were a year old, we had a bump in interest rates that went up to Dean. Were you in 1990 still licensed? Oh, God, I am the old, the old, old one. Okay. So we in 1990, it was the 80s. We, that's, we hit a high rate. We were like at... 12 or something. So we were really up here uh, about 12%. So the reality is the market kind of does this. It's done that. And typically it goes up for um, uh, five to seven years. And then it goes down for two to three years. And it's done that, like I said, six times in my 50 years in real estate. The price, yeah. 
1980, we were at 18%. Thank, thank you. 1990, we were at 10%. Okay. <laughs> we bought our first house in 1990, and it was 10%. Okay. We died in the time of having it Okay. And, and here, yeah, and here we were at 18%, 17 and a half. Um, so then we see, and we'll just hop over here and we'll say, okay, we were at you know, 2008, and then we did a crash. And this crash actually was 2008 to um, November of 2011. And so what is that, three years? It was about three years. So it was really still that same average that we had. And then the weird thing, so this was 2011. Then the really weird thing is, then rates just, or then prices just kept going up, okay? 11 years in a row. It's never, ever, ever before done 11 years. It had never done seven years, more than seven, okay? And I've done this wrong, so this is bad math or bad on my time. If I look at the different rates here and say, okay, we were at, we were at 10% when you were born, Okay, and then in, in 2011, what were we at? About six, yeah, six and a half. So we're about six and a half here. And then, you know, in um, 2020, we were at say 3%. We had a little, little widget of three. I got a couple of my people, by the way, when the rates came down, I called all my people to have them refinance. They all think I'm wonderful. Some of them got 2.8 and all of that just because they paid attention. And now here we are at, let's say, six and a half ish. The reality is the prices haven't changed that much. It feels sometimes like they do. And you think because here we are at 10% or at 18% that the prices should really come down. Do you know they don't come down that much? What happens is the time on market is longer. So in 1989, when I took a listing, I took all those listings at a 12 month listing period because 12 months was the average time of market. Um, if we had a dip in price and we did have a little dip in price, but that was also at a time when seriously, the average price was maybe 50,000, okay? Um, we still, everybody recouped it. So I worry that you're thinking because the rates are high that the prices are going to come down. Not necessarily. Okay, good. My, my question, I guess, is you mentioned an anomaly in the past five years mm -hmm. in interest rates, right? Right. 2% or whatever, 25 is pretty crazy. Oh, that was an extreme. And I don't know anybody at 25 I knew at 2 at 7 five. So increases, when, maybe that was more of a refinance number. Uh, in the price increase, do you think that was an anomaly also in maybe like the from 2000? No, I think to, I think the interest rates allowed those prices to be high because everybody was so focused on the interest rates and we have so little inventory. When you are the second fastest growing state in the nation, first of all, we home grow our own growth. And then we're the second state in the nation for in migration. So we're kind of on both, both whammies are ours um, to enjoy. I absolutely believe those interest rates cause those prices to go up. I absolutely believe the Fed should have jumped in probably two years earlier um, and, and didn't. Um, I think that us being at two and three for those who got it was a gift, but it was it created a not reality. And now those prices going up, I mean, of the 11 years it went up, and I don't have this number and I don't know if somebody can find it fast on a computer. Most of those years that it went up, it went up double digits. Nobody's income went up that fast. It was absolutely on the state uh, not sustainable. I've been say, saying from the time we hit the seventh year, we've got to have a correction. And yet we did four more years of it. So 
that created, I think, the higher prices. And yes, that's why we're seeing the adjustment. The reality, though, is we have such a limit for inventory. I don't think our adjustment in price is going to be much. I don't, I don't see that. Happening. Yeah, I don't. And unfortunately, our builders aren't building fast enough. And yeah, I, I think our prices will go down a little, but not a lot. So, all right, I think we've hit our time. I need some ahas. What did you learn today? And did we cover the two things you were interested in? Sorry, I erased them to draw a line. Did we cover those? You're very, you know, you guys are normally a loud and rowdy group. And for some reason today, you're a pretty quiet group. So, yeah, well, hey, I made it all the way from my house. It can't affect me that much. All right, what are your what were your ahas today? Any ahas? Yes. I love your adventure days idea because it gives people a more open chance to think about it instead of you just telling them, "Sorry, you're really wrong mm -hmm. about the market." Yeah. You know. Yeah. Better. Yeah. Anything we can do to help educate them to reality is a better way to go. Not all builders are equal. Are created in and yeah. you know, contact me for a list of builders. And the other one I loved also was the virtual staging. Yeah, it's such an economically smart thing to do to help your sellers get top dollar. All right. If there are no other ahas, and I have one more question for you all. So we talked about the fact that I'm not that funny. And so this class, and you drove through snow to be here, except for the Zoomers. Um, what did you take away that you're going to implement? I'm going to do a reverse bowl. Yeah. Plan one twice a year, every six months. Okay. I think that's a great idea. Not hard to do, costs you near to nothing to be able to do it. Yes. So you, what you have to do, the title, she's going to talk to the title company. Real Advantage does this. You give them an area that you want, and then they will tell you um, who the renters are in that area. And if you're going to door knock it, because you may not have phone numbers, if you're going to door knock it, make sure my trick is there's the rental house. I'm going to go to the one on this side, knock on their door, then go to theirs. I was in the neighborhood have my conversation with them. And then in case they're watching, I'm going to go hit the one over here. So I'm going to hit three doors. So it looks like they're not being picked on, but it's pretty fast and your odds are much better. I would say if you can stack the deck in your favor, why wouldn't you? And that's a stack in the deck in your favor. Okay. What else? What are you going to, what are you going to implement? Yes. I like the marketing based on like the time. Um, like best time to sell, best time to buy, and like plan your marketing around that. Yes. Yeah. Think about the season. You do it already when you're doing your events. Your events are based on the time of year. Summertime is when we do the water park, et cetera. So why wouldn't we look at our market and say, when do we want to focus on buyers? When do we want to focus on sellers? When do we want to focus on investors? When would now, because of the legislature, when would we want to be focused on first time home buyers? That's coming out in July. Plan a campaign around it. Plan your marketing strategy. Use that to your advantage. Do you think your clients will always remember that you helped them get $20,000 to use? I think they will. Okay. Any other action plan? Yes, Greg. Is it 50, there, uh, yes, 450000 is the price of the house or townhouse or condo. 450000 first time home buyer or haven't owned a home in one year, and it must be new construction. And if you, when you go to sell it, you would have to pay them back the 20,000. If you never sell it, then you never pay it back. And the money's available starting in July and they have set aside $50 million at $20,000 pops. And the nice, I, I like that they have to pay it back 
because it means it's a self-fulfilling plan so that my grandchildren, when they get older, may have access to that money for them. So I love that it's going to keep feeding other first-time home buyers. Okay, Chris. You can't do it as a rental. I don't know if once you own it, if later you can use it as a rental because they haven't given us those guidelines yet. But you can't buy it as an investment property. Okay, it is for first-time home buyers. Yes. Mine actually is kind of like a human uh, interaction thing that you said. So I, when I'm talking to somebody, I always nod like I am agreeing, mm -hmm. and I forget that it looks like I'm saying. Oh yes. yes. Say, let's set you straight. Yeah. So, yeah. Like so the other thing that I do is a physical thing, because you're right. We sometimes don't realize physical things matter, good or bad. So when I'm having to give bad news, like I was giving to Colleen about a million five, you're not going to get that. If I have to give bad news, I will often squeeze their arm, just on their arm. It just, it, it's a touch and I'm being harsh and I get that I'm being harsh, um, but I want them to be, my, my people know that I care to a deep level for them. I have watched them at Pi Day competing with couples in the parking lot about how much I love them and cared for them versus, oh no, you should have seen what she did for me. It was hysterical to watch them doing this. They didn't know each other. It was just great. Um, so they have never have a doubt that I care at all. But I am very direct about it. I don't ever want them to think something that's not true is true. I would be letting them down. But remember, I, I have four questions on my listing presentation that I always use. And you I've given them at this class before. So the first question is. See you later, Brooke. Um, the first question I always ask is, you know, um, what is it you want to make sure that I do for you so that you walk away going, wow, I'm glad we got Lee. And the second question I ask is, what else would you like me to do? I write that down. And the third question I ask is, if I wanted to make you a raving fan, in other words, if I made it so that you would never let anybody you know and care about ever use anybody other than me, what else do you want to make sure I do? And the last question I ask, what else would I do? Um, the last question I ask is on a scale of one to 10, 10 being absolutely, how honest you want me to be with you? Guess what they always say? Ten. And that's the point where I always say to them, well, that's great because I'd like you to be a 10 with me. I kind of failed mind reading 101. I'm not good at hints. So if you can be direct with me, I would really appreciate that. Now, as a 10, I will be direct and that's what I'm naturally. But if you need me to soften or cushion what I say to you, I am happy to do that. I just need you to let me know now so that our communication is always good. And sometimes they'll say, I need you to cushion it, in which case I will. But if they don't, then the reality is when she says something stupid, like I'm a hundred or a million five for my house and the highest house that's sold in there is 700,000, I'm going to tell her the truth. There are even times I'd say, you know, I wish I didn't have to say this, but you made me promise to be a 10 with you. You're not going to get it. You're not going to get a million five. Yeah. Okay, so while you're in your presentation, when do you give this part? Of it's at the beginning before I even start my presentation. Yeah. Before I get up to look at the house, it's the first thing we do. I find out where they're going, why they're going, what their time frame is, all of that. And uh, then I ask them those questions, my 10, my 10 plus, my 10 plus plus, and then the honesty question. And uh, then I know exactly what they want. You know, did they have a bad experience with some other company? Are they hoping for open houses? They'll tell me that. You know, I wish, you know, I'd like some open houses. Well, here's my here's my process. We'll do the grand opening. Then honestly, my 
uh, strategy is we'll do one every other weekend unless it falls on a holiday. If it falls on a holiday, we won't compete because we won't win. So that's that's how you could expect us for that. So, I mean, we can address all those things as we're doing that. But yeah, that's all before we ever get up. But before we even get up to go look at the house, well, yeah, yeah, all the questions are done there. Then we go look at the house and I have them bring a pad of paper so they can write down what needs to be done to get top dollar because typically that is usually to make it a 10, what, what do I need to do? Best price, top dollar, that's it. It's usually that one or number two. Um, and so then we come through and we sit down at the table and I go, okay, now based on the notes you took for getting the house ready, how long do you think it'll take to accomplish those things? And they might say a week, two weeks, months, you know, whatever they say. Um, and I go, okay. So if that's the case, then I really could order the photography then for Monday, right? On the 15th of May or whatever that might. Yeah, okay. So if you have a family calendar, go grab that. I'm going to write this down here. So Monday, the photos will be done on the 15th. So then we can put it on the MLS that Wednesday. So we could do that grand opening then on the 20th. Um, can you guys be maybe gone that day so I could do the grand opening? Yeah, okay. So let's write that on your calendar and write it on mine. That's all before I open my marketing plan. So we're all scheduled and everything before we ever talk about marketing. But it's because I start with those questions in the beginning. They know that I know what they want. Okay. All right. Yes, Greg. Are you just like never. You will never in 50 years ever have seen a single listing of mine that isn't paying a buyer's agent 3%. Well, you are all realtors moaned and groaned about the builders. And I tell you, I heard you doing it. Okay. And my response back to all those who moaned and groaned was you are to blame. You started prostituting yourself early on and thinking you could do it for less. And so you were cutting commission because you wanted the listings because you knew they were going to sell. So you wanted to cut me out of the deal and I'm charging a higher commission. And so you're prostituting yourself for less. When the builders realized you were doing that, and by the way, you were giving me a commission act to me also without my permission. And when the builders saw that, they went, wow, I guess we can do that. So you're to blame, not the builder. But no, I don't do less. The guy who said, you know, you're like the used car salesman. He's paying me fine full commission. He's paying you your full commission. Because that's, I'm worth it. Ultimately, I am. They're going to make more money using me. So I pay for myself. And that's how I look at it. If you're doing your job, so do you. Okay. All right. We got to stop because I have an offer to write for Chip. Thank you, guys. Oh.